Carl, what's the matter? You seem to be miles away all day. It's my secret recipe. Well, what about it? Well, I'm having a mental block. I've forgotten one of the secret ingredients. Well, didn't you write it down anyway? You don't write down secret recipes. Well, what's the recipe for? Oh, I know what you're up to. You're trying to weasel my secret recipe out of me. Well, it's not going to work. Oh, well, you're off your raisin. That's it! What? Raisins! Pureed raisins is the secret ingredient! Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of One Chef, One Critic. I'm Carl Wells, food critic for The Telegram. And I'm Chef Steve Watson of Central Dairies. Well, Steve, when it comes to recipes, secret recipes aside, um, we should really be more flexible when using them. We, we should learn to ad-lib with recipes because they're not written in stone. And there's lots of things you can do to a recipe to maybe make it a little bit uh, more appetizing for you personally, right? Absolutely, Cal. And don't be afraid to, to make those changes. Um, if, a if a recipe calls for some certain spices and you don't have them, Change it, change it up, as long as it's something that you're comfortable with, so to speak. Or if you've got your cookbook with a beautiful recipe that's utilising halibut, well, substitute it for cod or something like that. But one of the key things, though, if you're baking, stay with the recipe because that's more of a science. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we do that on this show, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't find uh, papaya, so mm -hmm. we used... Um, Mango. Mango. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is, uh, don't get too uptight about recipes. Have fun with them. Change them up if you want to. It's no big deal. Coming up on the program today, our guest is Jerry Stamp. He's a musician, singer, songwriter. And uh, what are we going to be making with Jerry? We're going to be making a beautiful pan-seared steelhead trout, Italian style. Ah, lovely. Mm -hmm. And Tak Ishiwata of Basho is with us today. And Tak is going to be doing a playful version of Eggs Benedict. Mmm, so stay tuned. For a complete listing of One Chef, One Critic recipes, wine lists, and more, check out our website. Let us know what you think of the show at 757-9600. Well, here we are, and Jerry Stemp, singer-songwriter, has joined us. Welcome to One Chef, One Critic. Thank you for having me. Well, um, I know you like to cook a bit. Uh, have you ever cooked steelhead trout? Never. Okay. <laughs> Tell well, us about this dish, Steve. Well, actually, Jerry, what we're going to be preparing today, we've got some beautiful farm steelhead trout from uh, Bay Despair. Uh, we're going to be cooking it Italian style, so I'm going to be putting a, a little bit of high Italian herbs on there. Then we're going to pan sear that with a, a few Kalamata olives, some capers, and I'm going to be doing some diced lemons to go in there as well. And to accompany that, Carl's going to be preparing some gnocchi. Yes. Uh, yes, I am, and it's fresh, and we've got uh, some pesto to go with it, and we're going to boil it in a pot of water with Newfoundland sea salt. So we've got a lot of Newfoundland in Flirty. this dish today. Exactly. So let's okay. get started. So I'll just sprinkle over with some of our Italian seasoning there. We'll put a little bit of olive oil into the frying pan, and away we go. And I'll put in my gnocchi. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Perfect. And these don't have to be boiled very long. No, two to three minutes. As soon as they, they float, Carl, yeah, and they're going right. to be ready. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, Jerry, um, you started performing when you were, I think, 13 years of age. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where were you performing when you were 13? Um, well, <laughs> it wasn't like, on George Street. <laughs> they used to have like all ages shows at the LSPU Hall for rock bands and stuff. Uh, okay. So, uh, a band I was in performed there, and I think the first time I performed in a bar, I was probably 16. Oh. You used to have to get like a permission uh, slip from your parents to go. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can actually do that. Well, you could. I'm not sure if you can now. I think, <laughs> I think you still can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or your parents have to be there with you or something. Right. Yeah. Okay, they look nice good. In there. I would put it the flesh side down first. And reasonably, that's going to be our service side. So when we turn that over, it's going to be nice and pink there. So I'll give you the spatula, the honorary spatula. Yes. and. After a couple of minutes, then we can flip them over. Sure. Did you come from a musical family? Uh, somewhat, yeah. My, my mother sang in like, uh, like choirs when she was growing up. Uh, my dad never like sang in any groups or anything as such, but he was always a singer. Yeah. He you know, was yeah. always had a good voice. And, and uh, both of them listened to a huge variety of music. 
So my mother listened to a lot of classical music and Lawrence Welk shows and things like that. Right. My dad listened to everything, you know, uh, Irish Celtic music mm -hmm. uh, to like country and 60s pop. So growing up, I had a lot of that. But my sister listened to uh, 80s and 90s pop like Madonna. Uh, and all of her friends listen to like Metallica, okay. stuff like that. So I kind of listened to a little bit of everything. So you got yeah. a good mix in the house. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you were a young kid, uh, did you ever make up songs? Uh, where did the comp composition I, I work did, come in? I did, but I never let anybody know I did. I don't oh, think okay. my parents knew that I was interested in singing until I was uh, going into grade ten. Oh. I had done a piano lessons growing up and stuff, but I wasn't uh, I wasn't extremely good at it. I wasn't very <laughs> proficient. I didn't practice enough. Mm -hmm. Um, probably just because I wasn't really interested in the songs I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but my mother would tell stories about how when I was like five or six, I would sit at the piano and just kind of make up melodies, which she says, for the most part, sounded all right. So, <laughs> so I assume I just played all the white keys or all the black keys. So you do a lot of uh, composing now, I think, right? Mostly pop, uh, pop rock, folk, country kind of singer songwriter mm -hmm, yeah. stuff. But I do a little bit of uh, scoring as well and a little bit of actual composition. So, so uh, would you be doing uh, some of that for other people, other artists, or strictly for I've, your own? I've done some co-writing things, yeah. um, which is kind of for whoever you know mm -hmm. wants to to be involved. We're yeah. singing. it. Uh, I've also done some stuff for a couple of short local films and things like that. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So feel free. Maybe we can just turn them over now. Sure. Let's see if it's not sticking, hopefully. Oh, it's just moving. Very good. Yeah. There well, you there you go. You've done that before, haven't you? Once twice. It's gone everywhere, though. Yeah. Perfect. There, there we, we go. go. Yes. They look nice. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. A nice yeah. size there, that's for sure. Jerry, you studied classical music at university. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> you went from classical over to rock, or...? Well, it's kind of... From rock to classical, back to rock, or...? Kind of rock to classical to rock, or <laughs> rock with classical and rock. Right, okay. Um, I was doing pop music before I went to music school. Mm -hmm. uh, in the school program, you do classical music, but you also study uh, opera and some world music, some, some types of folk and things like that. So I, uh, I was kind of using it as... I decided I was going to be a musician, but I figured if I'm going to try and be a musician for a career, mm -hmm. I'd best know all the rules and ins and outs. Sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Kind of, yeah. A, kind of, you have to know the rules before you can break them, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so you studied voice, or yes. Oh, okay. So you you actually sang, you know, Mozart and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So actually, Mozart was <laughs> first and last year. I ended up doing Mozart, but uh, <laughs> okay. you do you kind of do a little bit of everything in there. You do. Um, a little bit of opera, like one or two arias, um, hopefully towards your third and fourth year. You do some German lead, some French art song, right. uh, maybe something in Spanish, or you know, uh, I did some Russian one year, some Spanish one year. You can you can do some Chinese depending on uh, what uh -huh. kind of yeah. songs you're doing. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can do a lot of different things, a lot so, of different languages. So now, like when you're in the shower, do you ever do an, uh, you know? That's, pro that's probably the only time I sing in Italian okay. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> The shower is yeah. great for Italian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how long a period would that have been over? Is it three, four years? Or? Uh, I did my degree over five years. Five years, yeah. okay. Yeah. And uh, so then you, you uh, were in a band called King Nancy. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, King Nancy is kind of a weird thing because most people know it as the inception of what it is now. We, we never really broke up. We just kind of, we all live in different provinces. Yeah. Okay. So we only play whenever we're all in the same place. So it's not really a reunion, but we didn't really stop, but we don't play anymore. So. Okay. So um, it was uh, originally just myself and my friend Mark Turner, who was also in music school. Uh, he was a guitarist. And then um, while we were in music school together, we ended up uh, meeting a drummer, Chris Clark, and uh, bass player Brad Madden. Brad was also in the music yeah. school program. And so that just kind of became a band, and we kind of gelled really well together. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Toronto for a, a number of years mm -hmm. and uh, played gigs there and stuff. And eventually we decided it was time to move home. And so here we are. We still occasionally so, play gigs. Uh, what was it like living on the mainland? I, I, I would imagine it was much easier to get gigs on the mainland than to make a living up there. Was it not? Or It was, it was good. I mean, I think I, I had a lot of fun, and it made us much better musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain... There's a certain lackadaisical approach to music in Newfoundland. It's very rooted, it's very emotional and fun, but it's not a lot of like professional work ethics kind of stuff. That's why the people who are professional really rise to the top quickly. Um, so when we got to Toronto, we learned really quickly we needed to be better. Mm -hmm. We were good, but we needed to be a lot better. better. Yeah, right. So we started practicing a lot more. We chose like Monday was band day, so that was always 
the time when we would get together and rehearse. Then we'd go and like you know maybe have like a pizza or a barbecue at somebody's place, rent a couple of live music DVDs, and just study other musicians of any style and kind of help us figure out what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, that kind of thing. So are you happy with the decision to come back to St. John's? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we always. I mean, at that point in time, you kind of had to move away to make it. Um, but now, because of you know the advent of the internet and stuff like that, anyone can kind of get out there a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So I mean, any band can start now and just start putting the songs up online and get a little bit of notoriety, get noticed. That's just right. Just have to hit the road. And tour. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you can do it from here now. Whereas back then, um, it was just too expensive to try and tour out of here every year without anybody knowing who you no, were. No, you were. Yeah. yeah. Now. Uh, Steve, I think uh, the gnocchi is ready. Yes, it's time right. to take the gnocchi out, yeah. and I'm gonna bring. It. So okay. we want to just heat this through on the pan, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, there we go. Yeah. And then what I'll do, I'll just get you to sprinkle the calamatra olives over and mm -hmm. some of the capers, and afterwards we'll just touch it up with the parsley and the lemon. All the papers? Oh yeah, by all means, oh yeah. Just sprinkle them around right. just a little bit. Very good, Carl. All right, now, I'm going to head to the cellar and get okay. some wine. No problem. And uh, you put some pesto in that and stir it around, okay? Sure. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> How much pesto are you doing? Oh, just uh, maybe about two or three teaspoons, that'd be okay. fine. That'd be fine. So you say you 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 used to work in a restaurant, did you? Or? Yeah, I uh, I work mostly as a server, but you know you kind of help out, do a little bit of prep here and Absolutely. there. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess you want to stir it around. Yeah, a bit? just stir it around. That'd be great. Yeah, they're nice and firm there. They've been those potato potato gnocchi, and uh, that's great. Hello, Martin. Great to Hi. see you. Well, great here we are you. to talk uh, the art of wine with the man from the art of wine. <laughs> uh, I don't think Something. our recipe today should have posed you many problems. It's steelhead trout, but with a little bit of Italian flavoring, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I understand there's gnocchi with pesto involved, mm -hmm. so uh, so we're definitely in the Italian uh, Italian wine region there. For sure. So the For first sure. wine that I chose is a white. It's called Calai. It's from the Abruzzo region in uh, in Italy. It's a pecorino. It goes very well with uh, uh, with fish dishes, of course. It's a white wine with good acidity. So pecorino. Pecorino, yeah, same name as the cheese. And, and it's a grape. Uh, it's a grape, yeah. Oh, it's a grape variety called Pecorino. Never heard of it. No, I've it's uh, it's new. It's the uh, it's uh, a new wine at the uh, at the NLC. Okay, now. great. And uh, a second, the second one that I chose is also Italian. Is the Carnival. Uh, Prosecco, it's Prosecco, yeah, or Glera, as it's called now. Like the uh, the wine, uh, the grape variety is called Glera. So this and is the one with a bit of bubbly in it. Absolutely, yeah. it's it's a sparkling wine, and it has um, uh, great acidity as well. Then the uh, the next one is for people that would want a little bit of red with this dish, which would work. Uh, we have a wine from the same region as the uh, um, pesto is from, you know. Okay. So yep. this is a, a Lange Barbera. So it's a Barbera from uh, from the Lange area. And uh, it's very fruity and it goes well with this uh, how much with would this that cost? Well. Uh, this one is about $25. $25? Uh, this one's about 27 and this one's about uh, 24 Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to go with this one because I've never had this wine before, and you say it's uh, the pecorino. Pecorino, pecorino, yeah. pecorino is a great okay. variety. Yeah, oh, I've had I've had their cheese, but not their wine. what, not the wine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good choice. Thank you, Martin. You're very welcome. Okay, let's take this beautiful steelhead trout out now, pound seared with our Italian seasonings, with some capers, some calamatra olives, some chopped parsley. A little bit of olive oil there. Beautiful. So let's go and visit Carl and Jerry in the dining room and see if they'll enjoy it. Some wine to go with our steelhead Ooh. trout, which mm. looks absolutely marvelous. Yeah. Uh, I love all of those capers and olives on top. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's have a taste of this. Mmm. Mm. Lots of flavor there. Nice. What do you think, Jerry? Mm, that's delicious. It is, isn't it? Mm. Really nice. Well, I wanted to ask you, um, a couple of years ago, you, you received um, 
a diagnosis of arthritis. Yeah, sorry, uh, arthritis. Which is quite serious, eh? It's, a um, it's kind of a weird thing. Like any autoimmune disease is um, going to have varying levels. I mean, one person can have an autoimmune disease like mine, psoriatic mm -hmm. arthritis, and have minimal to no problems. Uh, mine is pretty severe. Uh, I've had it for a number of years, but uh, undiagnosed until about a year and a half ago. So I have been dealing with some, uh, some issues with my joints, muscles, tendons, things like that, uh, which is causing me to, right now, I'm kind of taking a bit of a break from performing mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. I used to perform, you know, 250 plus shows a year. Wow. All across Canada, touring two or three times a year. And uh, now I think I'm playing a show coming up soon, which is going to be, I guess, maybe my fourth or fifth show oh, this really? year. So, yeah, <coughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot less playing, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a... How, how did you handle that mentally? Was it... I, I mean, you're a young guy. Uh, when uh, you get a diagnosis uh, of psoriatic arthritis, that's, that's got to be a downer, eh? It's definitely a downer. Uh, it's kind of one of those things where you, you try to be positive. Um, but I don't even think of it as so much as being positive or hopeful as is you really have two ways of looking at it. You can be either positive about it and hope mm -hmm. for the best, or you can live in complete and utter despair. So you really have those two choices. So I chose not to despair as of yet. You know, so is there any family history of arthritis? Um, well, little bits, but nothing psoriatic. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, in that regard, kind of unconnected. Think, yeah, yeah. Um, but there are a few relatives who have had psoriasis, which is the psoriatic part of it. So you have to have psoriasis before you can have psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. So you wrote, or you did a, an album called Rogue Doubt, yep. which uh, I guess was part of your way of dealing with the... Uh, yeah, a lot of the songs are directly about dealing with it or indirectly, kind of poetically about it, metaphorically. Um, but the record was recorded... Um, I, I'd gotten a grant from Music NL to do a record um, in 2012, and I started to put the record on hold because of the issues I was having with my hands, my joints, mm -hmm. you know, uh, affecting my ability to play. Uh, but then things started to get worse in late 2013, so I decided that early 2014, as soon as I could get in the studio, I would just go in and do the record, mostly just in case, because I had these songs that were written about the situation, and I wanted to get them down sort of for posterity in case it got worse and I couldn't perform anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, so far, I'm still able to do it, just not as much as I was. Yeah. What's the significance of the title, Rogue Doubt? Uh, it's kind of a weird thing. It's kind of a term that I, I kind of coined for... Um, uh, people have doubt all the time that usually mm. comes from something, but with a disease like this, you start to think about all these random things that you don't need to think about, like I wanted to put the record on hold because of the issues I was having with my hands, my joints, mm -hmm. you know, uh, affecting my ability to play. Uh, but then things started to get worse in late 2013, so I decided that early 2014, as soon as I could get in the studio, I would just go in and do the record, mostly just in case because I had these songs that were written about the situation and I wanted to get them down sort of for posterity in case it got worse and I couldn't perform anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, so far I'm still able to do it, just not as much as I was. Yeah. What's the significance of the title, Rogue Doubt? Uh, it's kind of a weird thing. It's kind of a term that I, I kind of coined for... Um, uh, people have doubt all the time that usually mm -hmm. comes from something. But with a disease like this, you start to think about all these random things that you don't need to think about, like, what if I'd done this differently? Yeah. You know, where would my life be had I, you know, stayed with my girlfriend in high school or taken this job or gone and studied this degree instead of that one? All these kinds of things, and it's not necessarily a negative or a positive. It's just random doubt that comes in your mind. You you think about all these different things, other options, things that could have been, whether they're happy or not. Mm -hmm. So w once you get past this hiatus, uh, w what are your plans for the future? More writing, more performing? Oddly enough, for the first, like, uh, at being a professional musician, you have to plan ahead like two and three years in mm -hmm. advance and know what's coming to plan your tours and your albums and all that stuff. Um, this has forced me to not be a planner anymore. Okay. I'm very much kind yeah. of riding by yeah, yeah. seat of my pants kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, have yeah, to, yeah. I have to wait and see what happens. So, yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, we, we hope nothing but the best for you. Thank you. Uh, you're a great performer, and it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Cheers, Cheers. to you. Jerry yeah. Stamp, folks. Coming up, we have Chef Tak Ishiwata with us, and he's going to do his playful version, kind of an hors d'oeuvre version of Eggs Benedict. Stick around. 
Well, Basho Restaurant on Docker Street serves the best sushi in Newfoundland and Labrador. It also serves some pretty darn good contemporary dishes. Brilliant, as a matter of fact. Uh, the brains behind Basho is Chef Takeshiwata. He's an extremely talented and skilled guy. Uh, Steve and I have been fans of Tak for many, many years, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back on One Chef, One Critic, because you always do something really fabulous and very interesting. What are you doing today? Well, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I'm doing a little play on Eggs Benny today. Oh, good. Uh, with a, a few Asian sort of tastes. Uh, Interesting. Into it. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to look traditional, but we'll give it a go. All right. It's some amazing ingredients. That's for sure. Yeah. I've um, never had Asian <laughs> eggs Benedict, so no, I'm looking forward. Uh, Carl, can I ask you to make a waffle? I will you? make a waffle, and we've got our start in on the waffle batter here. So what, what have we got here? We can just canola oil. Oh, canola oil. Okay. And uh, basically, instead of doing the uh, English muffin, we're going to do a little tribute to Newfoundlandia and do a uh, Towton Dolls. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can't have breakfast without Towton Dolls, can we? No, that's right. <laughs> and alongside that, we'll just get an egg started here. A quail egg. Actually. Oh, a quail egg. Oh, yes. very good. And these are grown locally? Yes, they are. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah. Beautiful. You see the like size of that? Look. <laughs> yeah, they do look like those little Russian blini pancakes. Yeah, they, quick very, uh, they cook very quickly. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Put a little bit of drop of water in that. Okay. And cover it up. Oh, just to cook it all through. Just cook the egg. Oh, that's instant now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah nice and on now. Perfect. That egg over yeah. there. Okay. Okay. And we'll keep that down there. there. Yeah. Yeah. So I did screw up the egg, but anyways, so. I got a good one here. <laughs> A little bit of the locally smoked salmon as well. That's right, this is local as well. Yeah. Give it a good slice here. Yeah. Jack has the meanest knives in town. Doesn't he ever? Very sharp, that's for sure. There we go. Those beautiful Japanese yeah. knives. Okay, and we'll also do. This was prepared beforehand, but it's just a braised pork belly. Belly, okay. With the Chinese five spice. So that brings our protein to it. Exactly. Sure. We'll just grab this guy here. Yeah. I think I should probably look base. at this now. Yeah? Yeah. That's about right. Yeah. I'll just cut that. That's about right? Yeah, I'll just okay. bring that over Is this here. something that you serve on your menu, or is this something that you just created for today? No, I think this is a little time consuming for our menu. Yeah. <laughs> in trouble there. Yeah, we'll have about uh, 25 of those mini uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Asian eggs bennies. Yeah. This is quite light, so we're just going to stack it up a little bit. So okay, okay, that's nice. So it's about the same height as. Yeah. Down, don't know, put, oh, I see. I like put the smoked salmon onto the on, on top. There. Yeah, I like it. And instead of a traditional hollandaise sauce, we're using your house egg sauce. Oh, which is egg yolk, soy, a little bit of sweet rice wine, and lemon. Mm -hmm. It's not quail egg yolk, though, is it? Uh, no, it's no, just it's regular chicken chickens. egg. Yes. <laughs> Basically, I'll get that okay. On there. This one there. Oh, I'm gonna spoil this with two. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I got some fresh fennel here. So all this stuff is pretty much available in the, in the grocery, grocery store. store. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But fennel, you know, is something that a lot of people probably uh, don't use very much of. No, and it's, it's very uh, refreshing, and you know, you it's very versatile it too. Yeah. You know. So yeah. for the smoked salmon, we're gonna go with uh, a little bit of dill. Mm -hmm. The classic, just the classic herb for yeah. salmon. Yeah, for sure. Oh, actually, nice. before that, I'm gonna put the egg sauce on there. Oh, oh yeah, that'll yeah, give yeah, it that'd... something to stick to. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And not oh, to be shy with inside this dough. Yeah. I like the drizzle you put on the place before, and that just holds exactly. the towel and dough there. Notice a lot of chefs are using um, wooden platters and stone Ex yeah, it's, uh, it's for it's serving a, purposes these days. It's a it's a different trend now. Yeah, yeah. So and this one, some pea sprouts, nice. yeah. cilantro, and like you say, these are all red uh, ingredients ready exactly, available yes. for us. You know, so and for this one, I'm going to be using. They look similar, but this one is actually fennel. Fennel, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you use the right. base of the exactly. fennel. Yeah. And we'll finish it off with a little bit of chive oil. Must have used a sharp knife to cut them chives. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> You're only as good as your knife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Some yeah. salmon roe, you may have a little bit of trouble finding that, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Salmon have big eggs, though, don't they? They do, yeah. yeah. 
little bit of flowers. Flowers? Yeah, and then a tiny pinch of truffle oil. You always have to make sure the flowers you use are edible ones. Though. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, you just can't go out and pick them. Yeah. yeah. Well, that looks absolutely fabulous, yeah, Tex. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you didn't let us down for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and we'll see you next time. And that's it for this edition of One Chef, One Critic. Well, Carl, that looks absolutely gorgeous. Would you like to taste? I would. I think I'd it's like your to, turn. I'm going to try the one with the waffle mm -hmm. because, uh, after all, I made the waffle. <laughs> Indeed, you did. Well, I cooked the waffle. Yeah. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Mmm. It's a keeper. That's a it's a keeper, Tom. Yeah. Thank you.